This is an experiment. What do billionaires, cultural icons, and world-class athletes have in common? I'm about to find out. I'm John Aguilar, serial entrepreneur, former decathlete, and creator and host of the CNN Philippines business reality show, The Final Pitch. Each week, I try to unlock the secrets of Asia's world-class performers to come up with hacks that I can apply in my own life. My goal is to have you apply them in yours. This is the podcast designed to change your life. This is Methods to Greatness. Methods to Greatness is powered by Converge. Experience better. If you'd like to work with Converge, check them out at gofiber.ph or connect with them through their social media channels. Methods to Greatness is also powered by Perfect Health Philippines, a leading provider of innovative and premium massage and healthcare products to customers across Southeast Asia. This partnership is all about improving people's lives, health, and well-being. Visit perfecthealthph.com to know more. Greetings to our listeners from the Philippines, Asia, and beyond. Our guest today is a serial entrepreneur and investor with vast experience in the technology, venture capital, and animal welfare sectors. He grew up in Silicon Valley after his family moved to the United States from India when he was 10 years old. He studied computer science at the University of California, Berkeley, and has more than two decades of experience in the technology industry were spent at Hewlett Packard, IBM, and Microsoft. He went on to establish startups Simply Hired, a job search engine, and AtWeb, a web tools company. He also co-founded India Community Center, an NGO which has raised $40 million in funding and operates several facilities in the San Francisco Bay Area. He founded Good Startup, a Singapore-based venture capital firm seeking to remove animals from the food system, which has invested in leading and emerging alternative protein companies across the U.S. and Asia. The heightened awareness on sustainability led consumers to choose plant-based or alt-protein diets, and Good Startup hopes to be instrumental in this shift. Please enjoy my interview with Gautam Godwan. Hi, Gautam. Welcome to Methods to Greatness. Pleasure to be here. So right now, you are in Silicon Valley. I'm right here in Manila. It's 8 p.m., I believe, where you are. Correct. Right. And, Correct. Uh, yes. Yes. And, and you've, you've had dinner. I assume that you did not have a big chunk of steak for dinner. <laughs> uh, you are absolutely correct. <laughs> Uh, my dinner was uh, vegetables, so vegetables. as it is just about every night. <laughs> oh, as, okay, I, I would love to geek out on you know, what you eat later on, Gautam, but before we get there, I'd like to, for the benefit of our listeners and viewers, get a sense of how you started. I mean, uh, in particular, let's go way back. So you were born in India, and let's take it from there. I was born in Delhi and spent the first nine years of my life uh, in Asia. I moved around India, um, lived in several cities there. I actually lived in Kabul for a year. This was all because my dad was stationed in different cities. And at that point, we moved to the United States. And by the time I was 10, I was settled in Silicon Valley. So I grew up around technology and around innovation and startups. And uh, naturally, not surprisingly, I ended up going to school at Berkeley and studying computer science and business and came out and started working for one of the large tech companies at the time. Uh, a couple of years in, uh, to date myself a bit, uh, the internet was getting popularized. And I, along with my brother and a couple of friends from Berkeley, um, started my first company, AtWeb. And uh, that company was an incredible uh, two and a half year ride that exposed me to entrepreneurship and gave me a real taste of what building startups in Silicon Valley was like. And at web ultimately got acquired by Netscape. And I took a break, I took a year and traveled, came back and from there started a community organization. So I went into the nonprofit space for a couple of years, which you described. And after that got going and had a staff, I traveled again, came back and started a second company, this time a 10 year ride. And um, after that was sold in, in 2016, I then turned my focus to sustainability, and that's what brings me to what I do now at Good Startup. You know, it's very interesting to me how um, alternative protein is right now, uh, at least in Southeast Asia, it's being introduced right now. There's not a lot of it. Let's say, for example, particularly in the Philippines, um, my first taste of 
alternative protein was, believe it or not, in the Singapore Zoo. So it was in one of those um, kiosks. I'm, I'm not sure if it was Burger King, but uh, you know, I had an alternative meat burger. And um, I must say, it, it was a very unique experience coming from someone who has tasted alternative meat way back, perhaps maybe in the um, late 90s or early 2000s. It really tasted like tofu. But you know, this experience was different. I mean, for the first time ever, I felt like I was eating like a real burger. And I think that's really what you're investing in now. I think it's really trying to make what we know from before of alternative meat a thing of the past. I think there has been a lot of inroads made. And perhaps you could give me a sense of the things that have been done the past couple of years that has really changed the landscape in terms of alternative protein and its, and its acceptance as well. We are in a phase right now where our, our food system is just going through a massive transformation and alternative proteins are very much a part of that. What we're seeing globally today is that consumers are basically saying, look, I want to eat healthier and that means I want to eat more plants. So globally, about 20% of consumers now call themselves flexitarians. So okay. these are people that say, I want to eat meat, but I want to eat more plants. And, and so they're, they're kind of moving away from meat, but they still want uh, to continue eating meat. But when you get to the US, which is the most advanced market for alternative protein, that number jumps to 47%. And when you talk to millennials and, and people younger than millennials, um, this is the next generation, that's the vast majority of people. So we're shifting our diet. The, the second big thing, uh, that is going on is that the way we make food is changing. So we've been engineering food for a very long time, but we engineer food using food science and ingredients. That's what these large food companies are doing when they put food in grocery stores. But now um, we are making food using biotechnology and molecules. And this is completely different. It is a new game, a new type of food, and new things are possible, which is why the burger, the alternative meat burger that you tasted is very different because it's now created using biotechnology and molecules instead of food science and ingredients. And finally, um, we have a situation where uh, in 2050, we'll have 10 billion people on this planet and a much bigger middle class. A bigger middle class means people eat more meat. And we simply don't have enough resources to provide protein to 10 billion people. And so if we keep doing what we're doing, we will run out of protein. And so we have a sustainability imperative to do something different. So that's what's creating this whole craze of, of finding new ways to do something. But fundamentally, it's about technology coming to the sector and changing it, much like it changed transportation or energy or a lot of other sectors. Why, why do you think that is so? So the, the higher up you get economically, uh, the more demand there is for meat. Why is there that, um, I would say, preference for meat? Is it something that is ingrained in, I guess, the global culture, the more affluent you get, the more you have access to something which is by far, I guess, a, a more sought after food item, as opposed to something that you would just forage and, 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 or, or grow in, in a farm? It's a, a really interesting question. And I, I think there's probably a confluence of factors at play. But I think if we go back throughout history, meat was really considered um, a luxury item. It would be the royals, the kings and the queens that would eat meat, and the rest of the population would be eating grains or vegetables or, or other foods. And as we then moved through history, and uh, you saw that, that people became more affluent, it was really the, the, the folks that were affluent that could afford the meat. And meat at that time really was considered more of a delicacy. You would, you would have that periodically. You wouldn't have it on a regular basis. And so we moved into a situation where not only did more people get affluent, but we industrialized the, the, the meat producing process, which has a, a bunch of negative uh, issues with it as well. But um, the confluence of, of really standardizing production and more people becoming affluent is what's gotten us to the place where we are today. Okay, so you have, ever since in the technology space, you have been in Silicon Valley for a majority of your life. And um, can you share with us exactly how this has informed perhaps your decision to move into this new space? What was it like spending so many years in Silicon Valley in tech and now moving into sustainability, particularly for food? 
if I look back at, at my career in Silicon Valley, um, I was certainly immersed in the technology industry, but technology to me was just a landscape. What, what I was really learning to do was to build businesses. And um, that's really the, the craft I tried to learn over the last 20 years through building a couple of businesses on my own. And in addition to that, investing in lots of other businesses, advising startups, um, sitting on boards, just whichever way I could participate in that process. Moving now into biotechnology and seeing these companies, obviously the landscape is very different, but the fundamentals of building a company stay the same. And I think there's a lot of principles that can be applied that you learn in Silicon Valley, which are just best practices for, for building businesses that I think are just as true for technology um, or classical technology software as they are for biotechnology. And that's really, I think, the fundamentals that I'm building upon, even in a new sector at this point. Speaking of fundamentals, what would, and this is a very general, I'm casting a very wide net here, what would these fundamentals be? Well, I think if you look at the way that a business is created, uh, any business is created, and, and certainly one in Silicon Valley, it begins with an idea. Um, or for an entrepreneur, it begins with why. Why is it that I want to do this? Why is it that the world isn't good enough the way it is? Why do I want to do something different? Why do I want to bring this to market? And I think that that seed is where that company is really coming from. At once the, the, the company moves forward, then it becomes about the plan and, and how are you going to, to create this? But because these are fundamentally innovative technology companies, they're doing things that haven't been done before. And you invariably end up doing a lot of things wrong. Right. And it's just a fundamental part of the entrepreneurial process that you meander, or do a lot of things wrong. And so entrepreneurship in that sense becomes a lot about persistence. My favorite story about the whole entrepreneurial process is, is about this, this CEO who went through a lot of ups and downs um, in his business and ultimately saw a lot of success. So he was being interviewed uh, and they asked him, you know, there were all these ups and downs before you got to success. I mean, there were so many times it, that, that you were feeling so bad about the progress. What is it that kept you going? And, and he said, you know, sooner or later, I just figured I'd run out of ways to do things wrong. And, and I think that's the sort of spirit that captures entrepreneurship. So I think that based on that, eventually these businesses find a footing, they find a path. And uh, once you get your product right, you get your market right, um, especially in technology, you can scale very, very fast um, because these are virtual products and, the, and Silicon Valley is, is very good at feeding these companies what they need to be able to grow quickly. So right now you're in Silicon Valley, but you are currently based in Singapore. That's correct. Yes. So I'd like to understand the transition, you moving everything from Silicon Valley to Southeast Asia. What compelled you to make such a big, I guess, move um, to this part of the world? Since I had started my life in Asia, I think some part of me really wanted to come back and live here at this point. But obviously, that is something that needed to make sense um, overall with what I was doing in my life. When I decided that I wanted to focus on alternative proteins and specifically to create a venture capital fund focused on the sector, I decided um, to look at Asia because by 2025, Asia will be the largest market in the world for alternative proteins. Really? I specifically came to Singapore because Singapore in that respect is the gateway to Asia for alternative proteins. The government here has uh, created a 30 by 30 program, which essentially focuses on creating 30% of its nutrition locally by 2030. And that really is an outgrowth of uh, a lot of the food security issues that COVID highlighted. And so Singapore, as a result of that, is a hotbed for innovation and for activity in the sector. And in that sense, if you want to come to Asia um, and enter the market, Singapore is a very logical place to start. Cultivated meat, which is where um, you're growing animal cells outside the animal. Literally, you're, you're growing real meat and, and creating real meat outside the animal. Singapore has, for that, the most advanced regulatory pathway in the world. It's only one of two places in the world where um, it's legal to sell that in any capacity. 
um, and uh, it was the first in the world to do so and still remains the most advanced. Where is the so, other market, if, if I may? If I may ask. Uh, it, so for testing purposes, the Netherlands just approved it very recently. And, and so I think Singapore is just leading the way. Um, and so uh, here you find individuals from every walk of life, whether it's entrepreneurs, investors, um, uh, researchers, um, all manner of people really interested in the sector. And the government has done an amazing job um, of really accelerating the sector. Right. You know, that, that it to me is simply unbelievable, given that Singapore is such a small country. Um, but the 3030 plan, it can be pulled off, and, I sh and I'm sure it will. I think if Singapore can do so much with so little, and when I say so little, I mean in terms of the geography and, and like natural resources, as opposed to, let's say, for example, the Philippines, we have so much, you know, there, there is so much land, um, so much natural resources, but if we can use the Singapore example as a way to be able to come up with you know, innovative new food, I guess, sources, is that part of your thrust, I guess, as an entrepreneur? I mean, you talked about your, your why. I think it really makes sense uh, that you're doing it in Singapore, but what does that mean for people like us who are outside of Singapore, maybe aspiring to one day reach the kind of innovation that you know, some of you guys are doing over there? Well, I, I think the innovation that's happening is going to be global. And that's what's exciting because food is so fundamental. I mean, such a fundamental part of our life that there is very broad interest in it. And so you see a lot of capital and talent flowing into the sector. And we are seeing that globally. So alternative proteins to produce take 80% less energy, 90% less water, and 99% less land. When you have that sort of a resource advantage, you can place plants that produce alternative proteins very close to where the food is actually consumed. And I think this, this idea that food is produced very close to where it's consumed, I think has been a dream that a lot of folks in the food sector have had for a long time. So it's really great that with an area like alternative proteins, where you're talking about animal products, that this uh, may actually be the case in the not too distant future. And when it comes to specific markets, so let's say that, that there's a plant close to Manila and there's a, a plant, say, you know, close to Bangkok. Well, if the food preferences of those places are very, very different, it's very logical that those plants would have very different emphases in that sense. They would have different products. They would be catering to different markets. And so I think we'll see that kind of diversification and we'll see that breadth of companies coming into the sector to make that possible. Gautam, can you paint to us a picture of the near future where, as you said, you would have your food source or where it's grown very close to where it's actually consumed. In terms of personalization, if, for example, the Filipino palate, for example, is sweet, right? We, we prefer our food sweet. Um, how can something that is manufactured within our immediate vicinity be customized to our particular palate? How customized can we make it? Well, if we step back and we look at the way that alternative proteins are produced, there are three, what I would call, technology stacks um, in my parlance. You can create alternative proteins from plants. That's what you think of with, say, um, Beyond Meat Burger, where you're just using um, a pea protein, a protein from peas to, to make that burger. You can make it from microorganisms. And so you can use microorganisms to essentially create proteins that go into milk or meat and then use those proteins to produce food. Um, or you can create protein from cells. Um, and and uh, uh, that's where you're growing animal cells outside the animal. Now, when you take these different technology stacks and you mix them together, you have a lot of possibilities because you're using plants and microorganisms and cells. And so to give you an example, if the population in a certain area is used to having certain ingredients. So if, for example, um, in India, uh, people eat a lot of chickpeas, you can use that as a baseline ingredient. And the foods that are gonna come out of that naturally will have a sense of that flavor. It'll have a sense of that, that profile of that food. So you can tailor it based on the ingredients that are used. China consumes half the world's pork. And so you can imagine that um, you might grow porcine cells there, um, which, which you then can integrate into the product. So based on what types of foods are eaten, what types of ingredients are grown, 
um, and, and how they are processed, you can completely customize the plant so that it caters completely to the local tastes. Methods to Greatness is powered by Converge. Experience better. Converge has been an instrumental partner for myself, for our organization, because everything we do right now is digital. Everything involves liaising, coordinating with people, with other companies, and all of this is done online. And our medium being video is very, very highly data-driven. We need a stable, reliable internet connection to make everything we do work. What Converge has given us was a way to be able to successfully carry out all of the tasks of the team, reach out to our audience, to our market, and also allowed us to be able to create more things with what we do. My team has been a direct beneficiary of this. I think this pandemic has given us a lot of opportunities to pivot, and this is our latest pivot into the future, which really is a digital world. For Methods to Greatness, I'm interviewing world-class performers, icons, CEOs from Asia, from around the world. All of those interviews are done online. They're all done via a video call. It was very critical that we had a reliable internet connection that would enable me to carry on these conversations with these icons from all around the world. That is one of the reasons why we're able to do what we do now. So if you'd like to work with Converge, check them out at gofiber.ph or connect with them through their social media channels. This episode is also brought to you by Perfect Health Philippines. Did you know that massages are considered one of the best ways to recover from exercise and is considered an indispensable part of any fitness training and recovery regimen? Getting a regular massage not only detoxifies your muscles from lactic acid buildup, but also increases muscle performance, blood flow, reduces pain, and induces better sleep. If you don't have access to a masseuse, the next best thing is a massage chair or a massage gun. Perfect Health has a complete lineup of massage chairs with a whole range of features and price points. Their top-of-the-line model, Perfection 2, has all the bells and whistles. From 3D full body and foot massage functions, voice command, Bluetooth, and zero gravity. Their Perfect Relaxer Massage Gun is a personal favorite of mine, which I use on my quads every time I come from a long bike ride. Methods to Greatness in partnership with Perfect Health Philippines has come up with a special discount promo that is exclusive to our followers and subscribers. To avail of the special promo discount, get in touch with Perfect Health's professional healthcare consultants at perfecthealthphcustomerservice at gmail.com or via hotline 02-8831-6944 and give the promo code MTG. That's the Methods to Greatness promo code MTG and the healthcare consultants will hook you up with the best premium massage chairs, massage guns, and other healthcare products, all with a special discount. You know what? I have a confession to make. Last night, my wife, we each had a very big, like, juicy steak for dinner. Mm -hmm. And um, our daughter, who wasn't with us, I remember asking her a long time ago, okay, so you're all woke and everything, you know, you, you, you care for the environment, but would you give up your steak? And she said, <laughs> she kind of gave pause and said, maybe not. My question to you is, you know, when you see a steak in front of you, you see it, the, the way it looks, the way it feels, the way it smells, the way it tastes, the texture in your mouth. Um, and people are used to that. People love that experience. How do you see a future where you can simulate that experience maybe having the same aromas, taste, um, the experience of having that, that big juicy piece of meat, natural meat in front of you, but for it to actually be an alternative source. How close are we to actually achieving that? Well, uh, you are not alone. Uh, I think a lot of people would say that, that they really love a, a nice juicy steak. More generally, I think all of us grew up eating certain foods that we really love. And none of us would want to give up foods that um, we grew up eating, right? If you tell anybody, whatever you grew up eating, just stop eating it, I think you would see a lot of resistance. So it makes sense that we all just want to eat the foods that we love. And I think we have to create possibilities for that to happen. Now, in the case of a big juicy steak, that in our parlance is is whole cut meat, whole muscle protein. And right now the industry is in a very early stage where it's able to produce certain uh, products that really cater 
or create substitutes for ground meat. And so that's what Impossible Burger, Beyond Meat, and those are doing. Obviously, producing whole cuts is much, much more challenging, but that is also something that is being worked on very, very actively. So there are companies that have produced whole cuts of steak that are made from plants or microorganisms or animal cells. And you might say, well, how can that even come close uh, to what's out there? But for example, when you take animal cells and you grow them, a steak will have fat cells and muscle cells. Right. You can actually grow those and you can put them in a structure which is called scaffolding in the industry. And so it will look and smell and taste like real steak because really? it is real steak. Okay. It's the identical cells. So, but, so scaffolding in like for a common person, maybe it's the marbling, right? The marbling of the fat. Exactly. Which, it's yeah. that's what creates uh, the, the 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 marbling effect and and all those kinds of things. So so what's what's really happening is you're envisioning this product and you're saying here's the overall structure, here's what's going inside it, and then you're creating that step by step. The industry is many years away from creating a steak that you would look at and say, well, this is not um, something that I can distinguish from from a, a real uh, steak or um, something that you might even prefer. Um, and so the industry is a long ways away, but every day um, it makes progress, every day it gets closer. And that's the thing about technology, which is that, that when you move food to a point where food now has version numbers and it's being produced with technology and it gets better and better and better, um, it's amazing where it can go. I'll give you an early example. You know, uh, Impossible Burger came out, I believe it was 2016. And when it came out, it was a well-regarded product that got good reviews and, and you know, people started to eat it. But when, Impo what, but when Impossible Burger 2.0 came out, um, and, and I think that was 2019, um, the product was much, much better. It had um, more protein, less saturated fat. Um, it had a lot of... Uh, other uh, uh, characteristics of the product that were favorable in terms of its ingredient and nutrition profile. But most importantly, from a taste and texture standpoint, half the people that ate the Impossible Burger in a blind taste test in a burger format could not tell the difference between that and real meat. And so today, both Beyond and Impossible have 92 to 93% of their customers as meat eaters. So you are seeing the beginning of that trans transformation. I don't meet many people that would say that, that they necessarily are an exact substitute for a real burger. But you can say that, wow, they taste much, much better than you know, whatever you would have tasted many years ago, as you talked about. And these products get better every day. And the technologies get better every day. So I, I think that, that beyond the taste and texture and also the price, which are very, very important components naturally. I mean, we all want to eat food that we like. The health angle is very important because fundamentally, you can produce these products to be much, much healthier. So when you go to the doctor and they say, well, your cholesterol is high or you're eating too much saturated fat. Well, imagine if these products were much healthier for you too. It's really one of the best examples I can think of of having your cake and eating it too. And that's coming. Right. You know, Gautam, I'm one of those people who really have a hard time with my cholesterol. I mean, I'm fit, I exercise every day, but biologically, I'm just, I, I didn't win the lottery with that one. Um, I just, you know, my cholesterol sometimes can go off the roof. And um, if you were to sit me down for a nice hearty meal of alternative meat, what would be, I guess, the most delicious you've ever tried that I should try? So there's, uh, there's innovation uh, going on in the sector every single day. And I will give you some examples of uh, things that are, that are actually going on. Um, there is a company that we are invested in called Nowadays. Um, this company makes a chicken nugget. Um, I've tried it. And once upon a time, I did used to eat meat. So I know what all these products taste like. Once upon a time um, was how many years ago? Uh, gosh, now it's been over 10 years ago. Wow. So it's okay. been quite some time. Um, but and when you say meat, um, when you say meat, that's everything, fish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so meat, fish, uh, yeah. 
uh, across the board. So I've tried a steak. Um, I've, I've tried all these things. And so uh, this company nowadays makes chicken nuggets and they are delicious. I mean, if you actually just try them, they're really, really good. Um, the, uh, but the unique thing is that this is a company that has just seven ingredients in the chicken nugget. One would think that the quote real chicken nuggets are are simple product of they're just chicken. If you actually read the ingredient label and look at the nutrition profiles of them, they are very complex, highly processed products. So the conventional products are are um, have very um, challenging nutritional profiles. They have lots of ingredients you can't pronounce. They're highly processed. This company has a delicious product, seven ingredients, all of which you can pronounce, and it tastes amazing. What the the founders really love is they'll have families that, that come to them, give them testimonials and say, wow, my, my child just insisted on eating chicken nuggets. And now I give them these nuggets and they love them. Right. So it's those kinds of things that where, where you see that, wow, there is, there is a real shift happening. Uh, if you look at eat just and their folded egg product, this is effectively a ready-made egg that you can put in a toaster. It's made out of plants. And there was a, a millennial, um, an individual's a millennial that I was, uh, I was, I had this in my house one day and, and they were over and I, and I gave it to them to eat. And so they tried it and, um, and they said, oh, this is pretty good. And I, and I asked them next time I said, oh, did you ever end up having that again? They said, are you kidding? I bought it twice and I finished it both times. It's incredible. I'm, and they eat it regularly now. And so you see products like this in, in each category that are interesting. And, and I, and I do think consumers at a certain level, uh, are developing these tastes. There's a reason I think that that Burger King has the Impossible Whopper in every Burger King um, in the U.S. because they saw that and they saw that demand. And I think we'll see more and more products like this across categories of meat and seafood and dairy and eggs and and so on. Right. You know, with the chicken nuggets in particular, you said seven ingredients. How much of those ingredients are readily available, and how much of those are something that's proprietary? to the company? So uh, when you look at the ingredients, since they're by law um, required to list them, you would recognize all of them, meaning they aren't complex chemicals and, and things like that. That's what I mean by just easily pronounced ingredients, um, uh, except for the actual protein source, which is just simply um, an isolate of the protein, you, you, would, you could find those ingredients. Um, so that, that's what's really nice about um, a, a product like that. And if you compare it to any other product in the category, um, you will see that, that it, is a drama it is dramatically different. Now, none of that matters unless it tastes really good, but it happens to be a really amazing product. And so uh, these are the, the, the kinds of products I think that, um, that we're going to see. And the kinds of uh, products that we're seeing come out into the market now are, are absolutely incredible. You know, there's a, there's a company called Notco, which makes milk uh, and um, they do this using plants, but um, they actually look at the molecular formation of milk and use computational approaches with machine learning to approximate that. It's fascinating because when I opened this up and, and poured it, I, I could get this sort of, you know, you have a certain sort of aroma of milk in this, ah. I, could, I could sense that. And I said, wow, this is really curious. And yet the ingredients include cabbage and pineapple. Really? Wow. And you said, well, how is this possible? And, and so the kinds of things that are going on because technology is coming to the food sector are, are just absolutely mind blowing. Right. So, so I would assume that it approximates the, I guess, the texture, the feel of like animal or cow's milk, because I would think exactly. there would be alternative sources like there's almond milk, there's, you know, all, all sorts of, there's, there's some, um, I, I eat, I, I consume soy milk on a daily basis. So, but, but this one, I, I would assume it really tastes like cow's milk. It, it comes certainly quite close relative to anything you might have tasted in the past. When we have, I think products like, like soy milk and oat milk, and I think more studies of consumers and, and exactly the, the reasoning behind their decisions needs to take place. But I think that, that even though some of those products don't necessarily taste like real milk, consumers have developed a certain taste for them. Consumers happen to really like oat milk. I, d I don't actually believe, while they, while they use oatly, for example, as a substitute for 
real milk. No one is saying, oh, I can't tell Oatly apart from real milk. No one is saying this. Yet they happen to like it and they happen to have it to the point where there's certain coffee chains in the US where they have made oat milk the default choice. So you have to ask for cow's milk. Otherwise, they will serve you your latte with oat milk, which is absolutely remarkable. A lot of others have removed any premium pricing for plant-based milks. So you can essentially choose that versus cow's milk if you'd like. I wish we could say the same thing for um, electric vehicles, but that's another conversation altogether. <laughs> but um, you know, with I'd like to get now to good startup, and um, I'd like to know: um, Do you have a particular um, metric, or what, what is your investment thesis when it comes to investing in alternative protein companies? So, good startup exists to remove animals from the food system. Anytime we look at an investment, we ask ourselves, is this company going to help remove animals from our food system? And that's our starting point. When we speak with a company, the first question we usually ask them is, tell us about your technology. What is the technology that you have? What's unique? And the reason that we do that is because if you look at where we need to go in 2050, we will not get there by doing more of what we've been doing. We have to do it by, uh, we have to get there by, by doing something different. And to do something different, you have to innovate. And technology is that catalyst for, for innovation. So that's why we start with the technology. And if we get comfort with the technology, then we start to look at the company fairly systematically. We, we look at uh, the team, we, we look at the product, we look at the approach to the market, we look at the way that the, the company has been structured. We look at a lot of different factors, and then we make a decision on whether we invest. So today we have 21 investments in the portfolio. Um, and uh, again, we, we expect that we'll get to about 35 investments total in this fund. What's the most exciting investment that you have right now that perhaps are in the market, we can actually uh, purchase or taste um, what they are producing? Is there anything out there that we can sink our teeth into? Oh wow, uh, that's a um, that's a, a, a really uh, uh, difficult question to answer because um, we invested in every one of these companies because we're excited about the product. However, uh, I would um, I, I should mention that several of these companies haven't yet launched their products, and so, uh, for example, to, to answer your question, we have a we have a company called Lipid, which makes plant fats. So um, today, a lot of these plant-based uh, uh, meat products and so on use things like coconut oil and others, which don't cook quite the same way, and they don't taste quite the same way. But fat is a really important component. And what they do is they make much better formulations of that so that you get a better taste and it cooks and, and feels more like real meat. So they just launched their first set of products in the market uh, in partnership with meat producers because they sell their ingredient, this fat ingredient directly to plant-based meat producers. We have another company that uh, makes uh, chicken products, plant-based chicken products called Rebellious Foods. And they, historically, plant-based foods have been more expensive because uh, they're just more challenging to produce with the, the different kinds of ingredients you need compared to conventional meat, which is at such a large scale. And they just um, uh, announced that they're able to produce their chicken at price parity to conventional chicken. Really? Which is really exciting wow. to see. So I, I think uh, that, that's, that's another company that, that's really interesting. We are investors in a company called The Every Company. And uh, uh, this is a company that makes proteins. And so they have a, a wonderful protein product that, that they're making that you can put in, uh, in everything from supplements to shakes to anything that you do. And you just, it's, uh, it's completely made free of animal products, but it gives you all the benefits of protein and nutrition that you need. And so they're partnering with a lot of food producers to, to bring this to market. Uh, we are investors in, in Eat Just, which I, I talked to you about, where they're making uh, that plant-based egg. And the same company is looking at doing cultivated meat, so meat grown from animal cells. So, so many interesting technologies out there. Um, very, very exciting times. The, 
The last one I'll, I'll just mention, which is not uh, a food at all, but it's leather. There's a company that we're invested in called Vitro Labs that makes cultivated leather. So this is leather made from animal cells. And, and I have gone into their lab and, and felt their leather and smelled it. And it, it feels and smells like real leather, which is incredible um, because it didn't come from an animal. Right. You know, I, I see so many opportunities with that. Uh, I think even in terms of partnering eventually with fashion brands, uh, you know, I think it, it is a very, very lucrative proposition, if I may say, um, as a business, to think that your leather for your handbag, your shoes, could be of an alternative source is going to be big, I, I, you know, I feel in the future. And I think, um, you know, you're, you're in your space very interestingly for the right reasons, but I do feel that, you know, it is a very, very interesting space to be in just because the opportunities I think um, that it will open up for a lot of collaborations I feel that are going to change across industries, food sector being one of them, perhaps fashion, maybe other sectors as well that rely on you know, meat products apart from leather. Is there anything that you're looking at in, in the future as well? Well, uh, our, our fund uh, looks across meat, seafood, dairy, eggs, as well as materials that come from animals, principally leather, but also wool and silk. And in addition to that, we invest in, in companies that are in the supply chain. So the companies that are building the ingredients and the processes and the equipment that's needed to produce these end consumer products. So we have a fairly broad spectrum. One of the latest companies that we invested in, for example, is a 3D printing company that has incredible technology that is far, far ahead of anything else we've seen on the 3D printing side for food. And this is a technology that would actually be scalable. And this company can print not just plant-based meat, but also cultivated meat. Uh, and, and, so it's, and, and it can fuse those together to create a hybrid product. So imagine if you had a product where you had the nutrition of plants, you had custom proteins coming from microorganisms, and you had the taste and texture coming from animal cells. It sounds strange, but in terms of an ideal product right. um, that gives you, it tastes great, it is great for you, um, it's great for the environment, that's uh, the holy grail. And uh, I think we are getting closer and closer to that every day. Wow, you know, I, I can't wrap my head around imprinting the flavor profile of a particular food product into, into something. I mean, to 3D print, you know, the taste of something, it, it's just, I, I cannot comprehend it right now, but apparently, as you say, it's, it's, we're, we're getting there. We are, and, and the types of formulations that are, that are happening are just amazing. Tomorrow um, in Silicon Valley, I will meet a company called Mission Barnes, and this is a company that produces, in their parlance, cultivated fat. Essentially, they produce real um, pork fats, uh, real actual pork fat outside the animal. And what they do is they work with plant-based meat manufacturers to integrate real pork fat into the product. And it turns out you just need a little bit of it for you to dramatically shift the taste of the product because fat is how our taste, the fat is what's responsible for the taste and texture of the, of the product. And so here you have a situation where you could say, well, I want to eat healthy. I want to eat plants. And you're, you're having plants, but you're having them in this format, but it has these, this small element of, of real pork fat and it tastes great. So these, these types of developments are really exciting. You know, I'm just trying to imagine advanced extraterrestrial beings looking at the planet earth, seeing us consuming um, animals and now having people like you funding these new startups that are introducing new foods into our diet, possibly new foods that will render inferior anything that we've had, any, like any, any, the best steak or sashimi or whatever that we've had in our lifetimes. That is something I feel that is not too far away. I think beyond coming up with alternative protein sources, maybe even coming up with something, like you said, a superior kind of food that maybe tastes so much better than everything, than, than anything we've ever had and is entirely good for you, uh, for your body, for, for, for the planet. 
Absolutely. We, we all make choices every day that, that impact the planet. This happens when we turn on a light, we drive a car, we fly in an airplane, when we eat uh, the kind of foods that we eat, and you know, we use uh, single-use plastics. There's a lot of things we're doing that, that we know impact the planet. And I think all of us have an inherent desire to want to do things better, to want to find a way to have um, a, a smaller impact to be able to just live more sustainably. And I think we, we really, a lot of us want to do that. But to do that, you need choices. We, we need those choices. And so if, if uh, we can create more choices, much like with automotives, you have electric cars. Um, if we have food that tastes great, uh, but it's also more sustainable or it's healthier for you, I think that uh, a lot of us would, would opt for that. So um, that's, I think, the, the effort here is to, is to really provide consumer choice, to give more options to all of us so that we can eat healthier, we can eat in a way that's better for the planet, and um, we can just uh, uh, live our lives in a way that, that we feel better about. Okay, got him. That was very, very enlightening. Um, I think after having spoken to you about this particular topic, I think... Um, the impetus for me to be able to at least influence more my household <laughs> in particular to, to, to try to give up on the things that we're used to is I think um, I, I see that there's hope. I mean, it's just really how do you operationalize it like on a daily basis with your family, right? How do you go to the grocery and maybe at some not so distant future, you, like you said, you would have these, these choices, but I think more than that, it's, it's actually the willingness to just say that, okay, I'm, I'm giving this up, you know, I'm, I'm going after the better choice. Um, and, and if this means, you know, giving up on the things that I have been used to, then at least now there are choices, right? Because I think that is the first step. Well, I really commend you for really looking at, at this openly. Um, I think that there, uh, there is a lot to be said for a flexitarian lifestyle. Um, if each of us can find foods that we also like, that we think are foods that we can eat on a regular basis, it doesn't mean we have to explicitly give that up because I think none of us wanna give up the foods that we really love. But if you can eat the foods that you really love and sometimes also eat other foods that you believe are healthy, that have a degree of variety, then I, I think that, that not only does your diet become more diverse and hopefully more healthy? But in, in addition to that, probably when you eat those foods you really love, you'll love them even more. Right, <laughs> so, right. Um, but but I, I, I think more than, more than even um, giving up things, I, I hope that as, as people are more open, um, that we all make choices that, that um, gradually are, are better, more sustainable. Um, and uh, I think it'll just move us in the right direction. Right, so Gautam, I, I in the morning always have my uh, soy milk along with my cereal. Am I flexitarian because I gave up milk a number of years ago? Would, would I be considered flexitarian because I am making conscious choices no matter how small they are? Well, I, I, you know, the labels are, are, are tricky that way sometimes. I, I think that uh, what matters is what your intent is. And if, if you feel like you want to move in a certain direction and there's products that can help you get there, then by all means, I think it's worth looking at those products. Um, if you feel like they enrich your life, uh, in a, in a good way, I, I know I try to make those efforts every day and I try to do that in, in certainly not just my food, but in other areas of my life as well. And I think there's a lot of opportunities to do that because we, today live in a world that is more aware with better access to information with more opportunities to make better choices than we ever had in history we've ever had in history and i think that's something to be excited about right you know there's been so many documentaries made on this um, i know you're familiar with a lot especially in the past couple of years and people sometimes look at it and say okay maybe they're going the the opposite extreme and a lot also have gotten a lot of flack for just going totally to the point that you know it really is an unrealistic 
way of looking at you know, the lifestyle of going to alternative sources of meat. But with your experience, with your knowledge of the sector and the space, um, what would you say is a fair, I guess, way of looking at it beyond all of the hype and the documentaries that have been made on the lifestyle of someone who has completely shifted to maybe vegetarian would be you know, uh, one way of looking at it. How much of it is realistic and can actually be implemented for someone who's going to try um, this new way of looking at changing one's diet, changing one's lifestyle, parallel to an effort to be able to be a more sustainable human being? Well, documentaries, uh, and I love watching documentaries, but they can be tricky because documentaries inherently uh, and usually make an argument. And to make that argument, the documentaries are taking evidence that often supports that argument. I don't want to take away from a lot of documentaries that also are making an explicit effort to be objective, to get the views of all sides. But often you see the documentaries are just going in and, and really trying to emphasize a particular point of view. I still think they can be good sources of learning, particularly when you integrate them with, with other sources of learning beyond the documentary, if you're interested in a particular topic. To your question about how to integrate some of these things and, and where examples of that might be, I think there are documentaries that can be quite inspiring. One that I really liked, for example, is Game Changers, yes. which came out a couple of years ago. And you'll recall from that documentary that fundamentally what it's talking about is athletes using plant-based food for peak performance. Right Now, that doesn't need to be the end-all be-all of everything that you know about the topic. I think any of us should look at multiple sources and make up our own minds. But the fact that you have a number of athletes that are peak performers that are saying that this made a difference in my life, and there is science around some of these things, I think that's worth looking at closely. And if not believing it outright, at least experimenting with it right. and seeing what that might do. So I'm, I, I really believe that in life, a lot of times we focus on velocity, but I've at least found that it's most important to be oriented in the right direction. And if you're oriented in the right direction and you take a step forward or two every day, velocity actually doesn't matter that much. Direction matters a lot more than velocity. And I, I think that, that sometimes we get caught up worrying about velocity when um, you can go a very long way over a period of time. The, the concept of compounding gets, and the power of compounding, Warren Buffett called it you know, the world's eighth wonder, gets talked about a lot in the context of finance. But I think that compounding is applicable in every area of our lives. Uh, and that's something I really try to keep in mind, that, that if, if, if we're pointed directionally in the right direction, then we can utilize compounding and get a pretty long way um, if we just stick to it. Right. You know, you mentioned Game Changer. I love that documentary uh, as well. It's been, been very, very popular. A lot of people have talked about it. In particular, uh, that, um, that uh, relationship with vegetables, eating vegetables, and also, I guess, uh, potency in the bedroom, or in particular with the, um, <laughs> yes, you, you know what I'm talking about. So uh, that's going, I think, an extreme that maybe uh, a lot of people were saying, you know, that's just too much. Uh, that's just, you know, just, just overstating the benefits. But, you know, I think that was effective. Uh, Game Changers was effective in not just raising a lot of eyebrows, but in actually convincing a lot of people to to give um, that lifestyle, I guess, the, what it deserves, which is you know, actually going out and, and trying uh, vegetables more than meat. And um, I think anything that points to you know, living healthier and having an awareness of the impact of what we eat, not just to our own selves, our bodies, but to the environment, I think I'm, I'm all for that. But um, you know, I think uh, people like you, uh, with your company and, and your initiatives, I think, have slowly been responsible for moving the needle in terms of us getting there. And you know, I applaud you for that. And I wish that there were more of you, more funds as well, 
um, that would dedicate their resources to trying to see how we could totally, if not totally eradicate, but at least um, slow down um, the degradation of our planet because of what we do and save ourselves from ourselves in the future. Methods to Greatness in partnership with Perfect Health Philippines will be giving away premium healthcare products to our loyal listeners and subscribers. There will be weekly winners of Perfect Relaxer Massage Guns worth 9,900 pesos. And at the end of 12 weeks, we will give one lucky subscriber a chance to take home a fully loaded Perfect Health Trinity Massage Chair worth 200,000 pesos. All you have to do is subscribe to the Methods to Greatness podcast and follow us on our social media accounts on Facebook and LinkedIn and share the post link in the show notes of this episode on your feed. And if you know someone who you feel would benefit from our conversations and content on the show, tag them for more chances to win our prizes. We always want you, our listeners, to aspire to improve yourselves in every aspect of your lives so you can be the best you can possibly be. Check out the Methods to Greatness social media channels for more details. I'd like to now get into very specific questions that I ask all of my guests here on Methods to Greatness. And the first question being, I know you were born in India, eventually after 10 or in Silicon Valley, but wait, what, what makes you Asian? Born in India, spending the first several years of my life there and then being brought up in an Indian household through my formative years, I think certainly left an impression of the culture. That's a very formative part of who I am. But at the same time, I'd, I'd like to believe that, that being brought up in Asia, there is a larger community there with a shared heritage. I think there is a, a certain outlook to the world, a certain ethos that goes well beyond the borders of countries. And I, I feel I very much share in that heritage. And that's a big reason why I wanted to come back and live in this part of the world. Beautiful. And uh, I assume you go back to India every, every now and then? Absolutely. Yes. I uh, really enjoy going back there. And it's strange sometimes when you leave the country and, and come back after a long time that some of the things you might have taken for granted uh, become novelties or uh, become you know, strange experiences, whereas perhaps before they might have been completely normal, but that's the wonder of discovery, I suppose. Right. That actually, um, I'd like to segue now to my next question, which I think you perfectly framed with what you just said. Is there anything about India that you would like for people to see or experience? I mean, I guess, which is perfect in the context of you coming back as well and not taking things for granted. What is it about India that you would like for, I guess, anyone to, to experience? It could be anything. It could be food, a place, a person, uh, an event. Well, uh, India uh, is a place where two-thirds of the country lives in the villages. So even before independence, um, Mahatma Gandhi said it essentially that if you want to get to know it, India, see her villages. And I, I think that it's hard to get to the villages sometimes because you it's not a tourist attraction as such. There's not, obviously, people aren't going to know someone in, the, in, in a village necessarily. Right. I was brought up in a city, not a village. But there are ways to get there by doing things such as volunteer work. And I think that the opportunity to go engage with the culture of, of India, and certainly the villages are very diverse, but, but to, to do so, I think is, is very interesting. I, I spent a year traveling around India and, and ended up doing volunteer work specifically so I could get to the villages. And I, I, it's not a part of India that gets talked about very much, but, but that's what I would urge people to do. What experience would one take away from an experience being amidst any village in India? Well, uh, when I went to the, uh, the villages, what I was doing was um, working with a microfinance organization at the time. I went along with them to uh, the villages and I showed up, uh, it was four hours outside the city. So we, we got up at um, rather early hour and, and showed up to a meeting with uh, really, uh, it's the, the, the women in the village because the, 
with microfinance, as you know, there's some numbers that show that lending to women has, has had really favorable results. And I saw one by one, they, they were sitting in a big circle and they would um, go and make their individual payment. And what was remarkable to me was that a couple of women then walked in late. And um, these, these are folks that don't have a lot of resources. And they were probably not more than five minutes late. And they put in a little, effectively a little bit of money as penalty because they were five minutes late to this meeting. And I was thinking to myself, wow, I wish, I wish we worked this way uh, in, the, <laughs> in our world. Um, but just incredible to see uh, the kinds of things that they were doing uh, to build a life for themselves. It really puts, um, I think, the world that we live in, the things we take in, uh, for granted into perspective. It's beautiful. Gautam, do you have any modern day heroes that um, you think deserve to be talked about? Well, uh, I really admire um, Elon Musk a lot. And you could, you could say it's a, a cliche in a sense, because at the moment he's the world's richest guy and he's pretty much out there. But the reason that I admire him is because he's had the, the courage to follow his own path. And if you trace back his career, what you find is that he had these different experiences like us initial startup that he did, then PayPal. And in each case, he took essentially everything, all of his resources, and he put them entirely into the next project. This is a, a person who is going all in into everything he does again and again and again. And I think that that courage to follow your own path and to have a level of belief in yourself where you bet everything and you say, even if it doesn't work out, I'll be fine, but I'm going to give it my all. That, that is not something maybe I see highlighted as often um, about him, but, but I, I really greatly do admire people that, that have the courage to really understand who they are and try to bring that to fore. Um, because I, I, I really do think authenticity is fundamentally an act of courage. And I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, but perhaps there are a lot of parallelisms with how you admire him and how you've also decided on uh, perhaps forging your own path in your businesses through the years. Well, I, I find folks that have uh, done that in their lives to be a huge inspiration. And I, whenever I see folks such as those, I... I just, uh, I think there's a lot to learn there and there's, uh, there are things to really incorporate into your own approach in your own way, with your own voice, with your own actions. Okay, uh, my next question is, if you were to give a commencement speech, and I'm not sure if you've had, what message can you give to a lot of our young, I guess, graduates right now who are coming into this very unpredictable world that we find ourselves in, what would be your main message to them? And you know, what, what do you see for their future as well? Well, generally, I consider myself an optimist. I'm a huge believer in what this next generation will do. And I think that when I talk to young folks, they really, really express a deep desire to make the world better, to make wonderful choices that we didn't think to make um, when we were at that age. And I think that's the wonderful thing about the way that our society evolves. As far as a message that I would give in a commencement speech, I, I believe what the world needs most right now is compassion. I, I really think that we just need to have a lot more um, empathy and a lot more understanding about what different people are going through, what they need, what their backgrounds are, what their struggles are, because all of us have some struggles. But I think the, the incredible thing about compassion is that if you truly practice compassion towards others, the chances are that you will be compassionate toward yourself too. And in this day and age, that turns out to be a pretty big deal too, because I think with COVID and with all the pressure that 
that young folks have in this sort of new age of social media and technology and all the things that are that are going on with just the, the, the pace at which we live our lives. I think that that self-compassion is really critical and that would go a long way toward addressing the mental health issues that I think are hidden with uh, underneath um, and go alongside the struggles that a lot of individuals have. So I, I think there's just a lot of problems in the world that we could be better at addressing. And we just, when we come across people, I think there's opportunities to um, you know, put aside judgment and focus on understanding to um, listen instead of <laughs> try to shout out our point of view. And, you know, all of us are, are work in progress in that respect, but I, th I really think what we need most is compassion. Thank you for that. I, I, I totally agree with you. And, um, you know, uh, you having said that, I'm just trying to think of, you know, you being a serial entrepreneur um, and you being in the space that you're in. Would you like to share with us any particular things that you do that um, prepares you for, for your day? I know diet-wise, I mean, that's probably a big uh, contributing factor to, I, I, would, I would think, your personal peak performance. Um, but is there anything that you would like to maybe share with us that you do, any routines that you do on a daily basis that, that help you um, fulfill the things that you, 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 you need to do? I start my day uh, as much as possible with three activities. The first is journaling. Um, the second is reading and the third is exercise because I find that those activities as a baseline nurture my mind and body and help prepare me for the day. The way that I approach my day is that I make a ranked list of the things I need to get done and I look at those and as much as possible go down that list and get through as many of them as I can. The area that I would love to be better at is walking away from it and giving myself more just simple unstructured time off. I think it's really powerful to have time to yourself with no agenda at all. Right. It's in a sense a bit scary that even when <laughs> we take time off, sometimes we try to figure out everything we can stuff into it. Right. And I think there's an, an opportunity for me to at least step away and, and just take time. And, and I'm trying to build in that rhythm into my life too. Would you mind sharing with us exactly how you're able to do this? I mean, for someone like you, who is in a variety of things, I guess, uh, I think your, your headspace is constantly bombarded. Um, your, your inbox must be you know, just simply unmanageable at times. How do you find the time to just not do anything? I mean, I'm sure it is a struggle and something that you have to consciously just set aside time and a huge chunk of time for. Um, would you mind sharing with us like how you're able to do this? All of us are busy. We just, uh, I think we have so much coming at us. And I think it's just a function of the pace the world is moving at. In that sense, I think the mobile devices and all of the instant on uh, or the always on technology didn't help us uh, with at least that part of our existence. And for me, it has been a work in progress. It started out by me saying that there's just certain times when I simply am not going to work. Even giving yourself time off on the weekends, for example, may seem simple and intuitive, but a lot of us end up finding ways to try to be productive in that time. It might be in a different area of our life, or we might double down on work, or we might at least try to fit in, fit in as much as possible. And I've been trying to resist that temptation. So that's one that's more of a mindset that I try to get into when I'm not at work. The other thing that I've been doing is I've been stepping back and really trying to understand upfront what type of time I want off. And I try to build that in. And so 
if you just ask yourself, what are in this year, three times when I just want to be off or doing something else and you plan for those early, it's quite easy to, to schedule time right now in September, even if you want to take a weekend or two off, or I should say a, a, a week plus a weekend off, very hard to do it when it gets to be late August. And I, I think that doing it in advance and recognizing that if the rest of your life deserves planning, then this does too. That's something I'm trying to do. And it's very much a work in progress. <laughs> Trying to do, uh, I think, uh, and a work in progress. I, I can, uh, I can relate to that. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, yeah. like for me, fortunately, I, I mean, my wife uh, does that for us. So she says, okay, this month, you know, I don't care what you're doing. We are going somewhere <laughs> with the family. So <laughs> brilliant, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. <laughs> but yes, I perfectly relate with that willingness to just um, unplug. And just focus on, on yourself, on your me time, on, on not having any agenda. And I think that's very important. I agree totally with that personal, I guess, goal to be able to, to do that. And um, you know, what, what, what I'd like to now ask you is that what is the one thing that you wish you could have known or done sooner? I touched on this earlier. I would say the power of compounding in every area of your life. It just turns out that if you decide that you're going to commit to something for a long period of time, really good things happen. It just takes time to, to do something great. It doesn't matter if it's learning a skill or building up your body or learning how to keep your mind quiet or building a company or nurturing a relationship good things just take time and they compound. In fact, I think that if each of us were to look at our lives and we were to look at the best things about it, there's pretty good chance that none of those things happened yesterday. If a person really loves their career, if a person is in a wonderful relationship, if a person has gotten into really good shape, that probably is the function of a fair amount of time. And I would say compounding. It's simple continuity. You can almost measure your life by the degree of continuity that you have in areas that matter to you. And if you don't have that continuity, which is what I tell myself, you better start because a week later, you'll have that much continuity and a month later, you'll have more and a year later, you'll have more. Right, so it's really the consistency. This effort or extreme effort have to play into it. I mean, for the 10,000 hours um, of you doing that, for the compounding effect to happen, does exertion or extreme effort have to happen? The issue with something like 10,000 hours is that it implies that there's a destination. And I think the the best things in life, the things that we, we enjoy the most, even things that you might consider to be a skill that you're developing or something aren't about a destination. If you want to learn to play guitar, I guess you could say, I'm gonna play a song and then I'll stop. But actually when you get really good at it and you play a song and you're sitting around with friends or you're just sitting by yourself strumming and you're really enjoying that, that's not, about a destination. If you look at Warren Buffett, who is 90 plus and, and working away, telling people he's tap dancing to work, that's not about a destination. And so I think that if you have to get through 10,000 hours and suffer, probably I would say it wasn't worth getting there. And if you get to 10,000 hours and you're enjoying yourself, I'm not understanding why you would stop there. You know, I think if you were to convince Warren Buffett, I know he's, he famously uh, snacks on, on burgers, cheeseburgers, if you could get him to go with a Beyond Meat burger, I think you would have probably by then achieved your life goal, which I would like to transition to my next question, which is, what would your epitaph say? Uh, uh, he was kind and useful. I think those are the two really 
traits that I aspire to. More than anything else, I admire people who are kind and I would hope that I can be kind to others and to myself. When it comes to being useful, I believe that we can each be useful in different ways um, to different people, <laughs> different causes, and whatever it is, I think that being useful improves the world. It, it improves people's lives. It, I think, gives us a great feeling when we can be useful and we get to choose how we can be useful. But those are really the two things that I aspire to. It's beautiful. So I would like to now ask you my final question. And this is quite personal because um, I, as much as possible, would like to learn uh, or do something that my guests have successfully done. If there is anything that you would like for me to try, whether it's in uh, my entrepreneurial life or on a personal basis, anything that you do that you would like for me or anyone for that matter to try, um, what is that one thing that uh, you wish, you know, we could just give it a shot? Well, uh, maybe my response is a bit general here, but you may have heard this saying that um, life is lived at the edge and it's specifically lived at the edge of our comfort zones. There's a, an interesting book called On Becoming a Person. And one of the things the author alleges in the a book or says in the book rather is if you want to know your greatest path of personal growth make a list of your greatest fears and go conquer them one by one and i think that whatever it is that each of us can do to get to that edge and to give ourselves perspective and it, it doesn't need to be something inherently out there or, or dangerous or or something crazy Travel gives us perspective, reading gives us perspective, sitting quietly gives us perspective, and trying completely new things we've never done gives us perspective. And so whenever I think we have a chance to go and do something we would not have done otherwise, or is something that we think will stretch us in some way, I believe there's a, a real argument for us to go and do that. Um, because if nothing else, we'll probably end up with an interesting story. But best case, uh, we will learn a bit more about ourselves, which I think is really precious. Definitely. How, how would you recommend one, one actually do that? Because I'm thinking possibly, you know, you have a piece of paper, you write down the things that scare you that you would like to maybe pursue. How do you recommend that I try that? Is it just blank piece of paper and I just go wild and just think of um, you know, something that scares me. How, how do you suggest I, I, I be even begin uh, that process? It's, a, it, 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 it's again, it's a great question. I suppose I could ask you the same thing, um, but I can tell you what I see in my own life, which is that from really small things to really big things, there's always a choice. If I walk into a restaurant, I can get the same dish I'm always getting, or I can go try something new. I can go to that same restaurant, or I can go explore a new place. I can vacation to that same place I knew, or I can go explore something really interesting. I can choose to learn a, a new hobby or a new skill or not. I can go choose to talk to that new that person standing across the room, or I can go talk to the couple of people I already know. I can try to read a completely new book in a, in a unique subject, or I can go stick to my knitting. There's so many things. I think that we face these choices day in, day out. And the reality is that that, that takes time and energy and effort. And we don't always have that energy. Sometimes you're just exhausted and you just need to go to your comfort zone. And I think that's perfectly fine. But I'm hopeful that I speaking for myself that I would live my life in such a way so that, um, yes, I'm running really hard toward the things I care about, like this mission. But at the same time, I live my life in such a way so that I have reserves that then enable me to go and try some of these new things 
and have some of those new experiences, build new relationships. And so uh, again, it's, it's something that it's a practice and it takes continuous effort, but um, I, I try to move myself in that direction. And some of the best experiences and memories I've, I've had have been because I chose to do something that I initially thought, wow, I, I just don't think I'm going to do this, or uh, I think it's too much. I probably won't, you know, go in that direction, but I did. And I was thankful that I did. Gotham, this has been a very enlightening conversation. How do we support you? Is there anything that um, you would like to share with us? Uh, where can we follow you? Is there any particular program or even for people or startups perhaps who would like to pitch to you, um, where can they find you? Our uh, website is just goodstartup.com. And so that talks about uh, on the site, you'll find our manifesto, which talks to our mission. You'll also find our portfolio of companies and you can get in, in touch with us that way. But I would say beyond that, if anyone wanted to learn about the sector, for example, I'd be more than happy to send resources or information that might be helpful. And I would, I, it's a, such a wonderful question, uh, but I would just uh, say to everybody, if, if there's some way that I, that I can help, I would really be delighted to do so. Well, it's been a very inspiring conversation. I will take you up on a lot of the things that you've suggested to me, and I can't wait to sink my teeth into those chicken nuggets and the eggs that um, you recommended. Perhaps we could share that. We'll put that in the show notes as well. If there is any way that we could um, personally taste that or experience that. But, um, you know, it's been great um, having you on the show. And um, I wish you more success in finding these startups who will be responsible for changing the landscape of, you know, what we know and see as food. And I'm personally looking forward to uh, one day, a world where alternative meat is just meat, right? Or I think the, the, the term is protein, right? Um, I think uh, I heard in a previous interview you've done that, you know, some companies are just calling themselves protein companies, not, not alternative yeah, meat. Exactly right. So, yeah, I, I, I am looking forward to a world where that is a reality. And, and, you know, I hope with your help that that is not too far into the future. Uh, we're very excited about that. And uh, thank you for sharing this time with me. Gautam Godwani, thank you very much for guesting here on Methods to Greatness. Thank you. Methods to Greatness is powered by Converge. Experience better. If you'd like to work with Converge, check them out at gofiber.ph or connect with them through their social media channels. Methods to Greatness is also brought to you by Perfect Health Philippines a leading provider of innovative first-class massage and healthcare products across Southeast Asia. If you would like me to interview anyone on the face of the earth and want them on the podcast, or if you want to collaborate with us for future content or sponsorship opportunities, or if you just have any recommendations on how we can get better, just send us an email at john at methodstogreatness.com. That's john at methodstogreatness.com. Until then, we'll see you next time.